Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, and chapter 9, verses 13 through 21. The Reverend Robert Zagor is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from Revelation chapters 8 and 9. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. When the sixth angel blew his trumpet, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their numbers. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode on them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads. By means of them they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. This is the word of the Lord. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. These words from the book of Revelation come at the culmination of a very long series of plagues that the Lord has sent out by the seven angels and the blasting of seven trumpets. And what it comes down to is... The Lord destroys all of the false gods to which people cling because while they're clinging to false gods, they lose their hope and their ability to be saved. They put their trust in things which are unworthy. They put their hope in things that will ultimately and must ultimately fail them. And in so doing, they put themselves at risk it's surprising how even to the end, people will tenaciously cling to those, those things that can't save them, cling to those things which can do them no good and can save neither them nor their family, but they can't give up their false gods. It's important for us to understand that there is no God but Jesus. There is no hope, there is no salvation except, uh, except him. The Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has declared that there is only one intercessor between God and man, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Over and over again, we're told that there are no other gods, yet we create them regularly. We put things up. A false god isn't necessarily just an idol to which you bow, although we do do that. We do that making idols of houses, idols of cars, idols of Buddhas, idols of all sorts of things that really can't save and have no ability or thought to save. But really, a false god is anything that we fear, love, or trust more than the true God. That's what Luther said in his great teaching in the small catechism on the first commandment. About the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, Luther writes, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. 
What do you fear, love, and trust? What do we all fear, love, and trust? Our Lord has no choice but to strip these from our hands. If you want to lose something in your life, make a god of it, a false god of it. Because it will either be crushed under the weight, or God will strip it away. It's important to understand that. Because although he doesn't willfully grieve the children of men, as the Scripture says, he would rather have you regret the loss of something that's perishing than the loss of your soul. And so we come to the final words of our reading today. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And we can point that out quite easily in our world today. All you've got to do is turn on the news. All you've got to do is turn on Netflix, for goodness sake, and there you see before you a raid in mass parade murders and adultery and thefts and evil. Portrayed as good. Portrayed as something that we should honor and uphold. Listen to the decisions of the Supreme Court lately or the utterances of those in Congress or the laws made in claiming that we're about equity. You've got to give rights to people who are doing things which are deplorable to God that deny their Creator, that deny His wisdom and say He didn't know what He was doing when He made me. Instead of saying... I've sinned against the Lord and I've used that which he's given me for the wrong reason, for the wrong purposes, and have allowed my seeking after pleasure and my seeking after my own desires to run and rule my life rather than the purpose for which God has made me. We declare that God and those who support his word are evil in our society. We promote it across the world. We now have new political laws saying that abortions can be promoted around the world through the use of U.S. government funds. State after state have passed laws allowing abortion to be legal right up to the moment of birth. And if a child who was in the midst of being aborted is born alive, in several states the doctors have the right to kill that child. These are the things about which the Lord has told us to repent. And we should. These are the things that the book of Revelation says the plagues continue because people would not repent. Even when facing judgment, they would cling to those false things. This is important, but it's also important to understand that repentance doesn't chiefly start with somebody else's sin. And it isn't best weighed on somebody else's sin. We can't repent for another, even though that seems to be a very fervent activity among those who claim to be woke to repent for the sake of others, to decry for the sake of others that which they've done, that which society has done, therefore justifying themselves and saying, I have no part of this, this isn't my family, this isn't my home, I have no responsibility for these things, these are the actions of evil people. But I myself am righteous. Now we're very good at repenting for others, of saying what's wrong with them, where their sins have hurt, have hurt our God who loves us and have rebelled against him. We're much less, much less anxious to repent of that which we do, which turns his wrath on us, that for which we've deserved the coming of the plagues, the hardships, the sorrows, 
grief, and even our own death. In fact, perhaps the greatest God that we face is ourselves. We can't imagine the world without us. Oh, we can imagine that the world will go on after our deaths, but everything we do tries to lock our place among our family and our friends, among those that we love, that they would remember us. And we fight with everything we have and would give everything we have for even another minute or hour or days or years so that the world might not know what it's like without us. And while life is a precious gift and nothing to be trifled with and you can err on either side of it, my point is not that our life should be down, should be gainsayed or that we should say we don't appreciate it, love it, or want it but we shouldn't put it ahead of God. We shouldn't promote it ahead of our Father. This is the lesson that Jesus taught us on the cross. There are things more valuable than your life if you truly love. Those are the beloved. Jesus didn't spare his life, but gave, him up, gave himself up for us all. He didn't save his life. He didn't spare himself from suffering. He didn't spare himself from pain or agony or abuse. He didn't, es he didn't escape from wicked people who had no righteousness of their own, but rather submitted himself to their worst evils and died at their hand. Because greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. His life meant something because his life was given into something, given for something, for his Father's greatest desire, for his greatest love, the people that he had created, his bride, the church. This is important to remember as we read these words because we're always tempted to turn toward others, declare their need for repentance, and hate them. The words repentance call on us, not them. They look inward, not outward. We can't repent for another. But those who do repent who see their own sins and realize that they can do nothing to attain their own righteousness or forgiveness, have an advocate of greater worth than all the world and all the universe assembled together, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who poured out his life and his blood for them. And by his gift we are redeemed. But his redemption would mean nothing if even God was too small to overcome our sins and by dying he was left dead. And on the third day he rose again from the dead declaring that our justification is a work complete. And now he ascends and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. The judgment of those whose sin is already in place as he sits enthroned on high. But instead of crying out for the day that their guilt will be declared openly, we should cry out for the day when those that we love and those that the Lord has placed into our lives are gathered into his family and into his salvation and into the hope and peace and trust that the world doesn't know but needs to be proclaimed and that we, the people of God, the church, might proclaim a love that the world can't find on its own. It has to be revealed from heaven through God's word, through the proclamation of the gospel, and through the administration of his gifts. We, God's people, are the recipients of the greatest gift in all the history of the world, and we're made a part of the greatest rescue mission, too. 
The blood of Jesus cries out on our behalf before the Father and is heard. And he who sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, risen from that death, is the one who runs and rules the universe now. And we trust where he's going, even in the midst of a great pandemic where people are not repenting of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. We, the church, turn and figuratively rend our garments. We cry between the portico and the altar, Lord, save your people and bless your heritage. We ask that where our sins have made us a pariah before our God, unrighteous and unworthy, that his blood would make us clean. And that we now, the people of the resurrection, may live forever in his kingdom in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, starting not on the day of our death, but starting today. And that when he calls us from our graves, we might truly rejoice with all of those that we love who have also heard the word of God, some by the Lord's hand and honor, by the work of the Holy Spirit, may have even heard that word from our mouths. Let us pray for those who are in need of God's salvation and for ourselves. Let's receive the gifts of God with joy and thanksgiving because he who poured out his blood for us has made us righteous. And as we see death drawing near a sinful and dying world in the very midst of death, life, death has us surrounded. No, in the midst of death, we live for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for chapel. Today we pray for the Reverend Shawan and Krista Trump who serve the Lord in Kenya. The broadcast of chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces, visit kfuo.org chapel.